Welcome to part two of topic one on molecular structures. In this part of the lecture we're going to focus on MER units and differences between different types of MERs based on their structures. Recall that a MER unit is the single building block of a larger polyeth whoops, excuse me, a larger polymer. So in this case the MER unit of polyethylene consists of two carbon atoms with one hydrogen atom coming off each side of the carbon atom. If we link those MER units together, we end up with a very long chain of, of MERs called a polymer, or polymer as we know it. Keep in mind that the length of the chain is a very important parameter in the properties of the polymer. Very short chain molecules such as methane and ethane tend to be gaseous in state. As the chain lengthens, it takes on a liquid state at ambient pressure and temperature. And as the chain becomes much longer, such as paraffin wax or polyethylene, it becomes a solid. There are two basic methods of creating polymers, addition polymerization and condensation polymerization. Addition polymerization, also known as free radical polymerization, involves two basic steps. First, the creation of what are called terminal radicals. So a terminal radical is when you have a molecule that is broken in half to create two two submolecules with exposed bonds. These single exposed bonds will react with one of the mer groups and close off the end of the chain. The more of these terminal groups you have in the polymer blend, the shorter the chain will be because it will cut off the growth of the chain sooner. The second step is the addition step. In this case, the mer units, so here you have a carbon-carbon double bond which is broken to form a single bond, and then exposes the extra carbon atom bonds on each side is bonded to the terminal group first. Then the other exposed at bond is allowed to bond to yet another polyethylene mer group and so on until eventually you end up with a very long chain of molecules. Addition polymerization leads to what are called the vinyl polymers. Vinyl polymers all have the basic same, same basic structure in which you have two carbon atoms along the backbone chain in the MER, and then you have four side groups. Now those side groups can be a variety of different things. They could be atoms, such as fluorine and chlorine, aliphatic groups, such as methane or pentane groups, or aromatics, such as benzene. So let's take a look at some of the common vinyl structures that are formed by addition polymerization. And I'm going to try to draw in the mer group structure. So for side groups where I have just atoms such as polyethylene and polytetrafluoroethylene, in this case the mer structure involves carbon to carbon with the unexposed bonds on either side or the unbonded bonds with the, I'll just put R here for the reaction group coming off the sides. So each of these R's would be replaced by a hydrogen atom in the case of polyethylene or a fluorine atom in the case of polytetrafluoroethylene. For the more slightly more complicated MERS, I have carbon bonded to carbon. And then I have hydrogen atoms coming off in all of these cases. except for one of the side groups is this R group which might be a chlorine or fluorine atom it might be a methyl group which would lead to polypropylene it could be a cyanide group which leads to polyacrylonitrile or it could be a benzyl group which leads to polystyrene and finally I could have another methyl or excuse me vinyl group in which two of the side groups are radicals. Something like this. Okay, so we get polyvinylidene chloride and polyvinylidene fluoride. 
the idene distinguishing it from polyvinyl chloride, which has only one chlorine instead of two, as in polyvinyl idene. The second type of polymerization is called condensation polymerization, or step polymerization. In this case, two molecules are combined, and importantly, there results in a small molecule byproduct, and oftentimes that byproduct is either water or an alcohol. So for example, I might bond dimethyl terephthalate and ethylene glycol together, where the hydrogen and the ethylene glycol bonds with this methyl alcohol group over here in the dimethyl terephthalate, and together they form methyl alcohol, which is a byproduct that can be used for other applications. The product that's actually produced then becomes the combination of the terephthalate molecule and the glycol molecule, ethylene glycol molecule. Ultimately, in the secondary, in another step, this hydrogen atom will be cleaved off, as will this methyl alcohol group, and you'll bond in another polyethylene terephthalate repeat unit on either side, making a long chain. Many polymers are made by condensation polymerization, such as amides, carbonates, ethers, sulfones, and urethanes. So what are the differences between these different polymers? Well, amides all contain the same basic cyanide group with a double bonded oxygen coming off. So for example, here in polyamide 6, or nylon 6, we see that we have the cyanide group here, carbon-nitrogen bond, with a double bond oxygen located here. In polyamide 6, 6, you have the same amide group located right here. In addition, you have a nitrogen-hydrogen bond over here on the end, six carbon atoms away from this nitrogen-hydrogen bond. That's where it gets the name 6, 6. Six carbon atoms here and six carbon atoms here. Let me change my pointer. Carbonates involve carbon bonded to three oxygen atoms, including a double bond to one of the oxygen atoms. So a good example of a carbonate is polycarbonate. And you can see here you have oxygen bonded to carbon, double bonded to oxygen, and that carbon is bonded to this oxygen atom over here. An ester group involves carbon, double bonded to oxygen, and bonded to oxygen, which is then bonded to a second radical group. So polyethylene terephthalate contains two ester groups, one located here and one located here. Ethers involve an oxygen with two radical groups bonded to either side of it. So in polyether sulfone, we see an oxygen bond here that is the indication of an ether group, as well as another one here, hence the name polyether. It's also known as polyether sulfone because it contains a sulfone group, where you have two radicals bonded to a sulfur atom, plus two oxygens double bonded to the sulfone, to the sulfur atom. So we see the sulfone group here. Finally are the urethanes. And urethanes are a complex subgroup where you have two carbon atoms bonded to oxygen, bonded to another carbon double bonded to oxygen with an amine group sticking off the side. So this is similar to an ester group, only it has a longer chain with more carbon atoms bonded off the side. And polyurethane would be the classic example. Here we see the two carbon ethyl group bonded to the oxygen, bonded to carbon, double bonded to oxygen, and then bonded to the amine group. And that repeats over again here. That's what makes it the polyurethane. When we make polymer chains, one of the most important considerations, as was mentioned before, is how long the chains are. The measurement of the chain length is given by the degree of polymerization. The degree of polymerization is the average number of Mur units in the chain. The higher the degree of polymerization, the longer the chain. We calculate the degree of polymerization by taking the average chain molecular mass, or m bar, and dividing it by the Mur molecular mass, or lowercase m. Now the assumption behind the degree of polymerization is that the polymer is what we call monodispersed. Monodispersed means that all the chains have exactly the same length. But of course, this is probably not true. We can't control the chemistry, chemistry reactions for every single chain. 
Instead, we get an average chain length with some distribution about that length. It turns out that most polymers are polydispersed. This means that the molecule has the sample has molecules that are both very small and very large, but most of them are somewhere in the middle. The, the resulting molecular weight distribution is usually skewed towards larger molecules, meaning that it looks like a bell curve except that it contains a small number of very large molecules present that would otherwise not be there if it were normally distributed. Well, it turns out we can calculate the, no, the average molecular weight a number of different ways. The first way is what we call the number average molecular weight, or m sub n. In this case, what we do is we take the we take the molecular mass of the molecules and organize them into bins, I bins. And then we take the number of molecules in that bin, n, and multiply by the mass of the molecules in that bin. And then divide by the sum of all the total number of molecules. That's where it gets the name number average molecular weight, because you're dividing by the total number of molecules within the, um, within the, the grouping, within all the bins. An alternative way to do it is the weighted average molecular weight. In this case, we take the sum of the number of molecules within a bin times the mo molecules in the bin squared, the mass of the molecules squared, divided by the sum of the number of molecules in a bin times the molecular mass of that bin. And finally, there's something called the Z average molecular weight, which cubes the molecular mass in this case and squares the molecular mass in the bottom of the ratio. Now, what's important here is not so much how you actually calculate these molecular weights, but how the molecular weights relate to the distribution. As you can see, M sub N comes closest to representing the peak of the molecular weight distribution, but it tends to emphasize smaller molecules and ignores the larger molecules. M sub Z, on the other hand, emphasizes the large molecules, but doesn't represent the majority of the molecules at the midpoint of the distribution. And M sub W is somewhere between the two. So as always the case, M sub Z is larger than M sub W, which is larger than M sub N. An important parameter is something called the polydispersity index. The polydispersity index is the ratio of the weighted average molecular weight to the number average molecular weight. Typical